Take your Bible, turn to Genesis 11. We're talking about building the Tower of Babel, and I, I hadn't planned on dealing with this tonight, but I am going to share it just sort of as a side note uh, for you tonight. Only me, okay? I don't expect that everybody does this, um, but God, God just said certain things to me, teaching me how to see things in the Bible that, that are there. I don't see anything that's not there. I see things that are there. I believe God is a God of order. What was that verse, Bradley? God is not the author of confusion, okay? Uh, he is an author of order. He does things in a, in a predictable pattern. That which was is that which shall be, okay? So if you want to see the future, look at the past according to the scriptures, and God does everything in order. And one of the things God has taught me to do, he's taught me to count things and see his order in the scriptures, and then you can see it, uh, you can see it in this world. Uh, I believe God uses numbers because numbers represent God's order. And if, if, I, if I could just talk about this just for a minute. Uh, what is the very last number? Doesn't exist. It is, numbers are the very nature of God in that there is no end to them. And if you go into negative numbers, there is no end that way either. They are infinite either way you look at them. Okay. And they never, ever change. What's two plus two? If I were to go to China and ask them what is two plus two, what would they say? If I were to go to Babylon 4,000 years ago and ask them what is two plus two, what would they say? Four. They never change. Amen? Okay? So God, God is, and in, all through the Bible you'll see, and, and such and such was added, and they added, and this, and you'll see, uh, you'll see subtraction in the Bible, taken away. God multiplied them, okay? God divided, I mean, you'll see those things, those concepts in the Bible, and there's, it goes a lot deeper than that. Uh, but anyway, God taught me to count things, and so I count things in the Bible, and I, and I see if, if God uses numbers, we know that the devil uses numbers, in fact, I had... I had somebody email me this week uh, just with their rake, raking me over the coals because they, in, uh, I was, in their opinion, uh, teaching everybody occult numerology, okay? And that is so far from the truth. But anyway, we know the devil uses numbers. Who's, what's an unlucky number? Everybody says 13 is an unlucky number. There is actually an occult principle that, uh, that deals with that. Um, in the occult world, in the mystery religions world, everything is done on a ritual. If you've ever watched a Roman Catholic priest, Joe, you've seen a Roman Catholic priest. From Sunday to Sunday, from service to service, he does the exact same thing, including his hand motions. You've seen him do this, right? Okay. Um, they, will do, they will do everything exactly the way it's prescribed in a ritual and a liturgy. And that's because... They believe that those actions, a certain way, certain words, invoke God. But we know that that's not true, okay? It does invoke the devil because that's how he is invoked is by certain ways and certain things. And so in the occult, they will do things like they'll draw a circle and put a pentagram in it and get inside that and that'll bring a demon on or whatever, okay? So they operate in, in, an, in a sort of an order. May 1st is... There's, it's an occult holiday is what it is, okay? It's called the Feast of Beltane. Um, May 1st, if you count from the beginning of the year, May 1st is the 121st day of the year, okay? Now, who's got a, who's got a calculator? Real quick. Oh, okay. 121 divided by 11. 11. It's 11 times 11, Okay. There's, there's certain things that have happened on this day historically that I won't get into, but I will tell you that this Saturday is May 1st. This Saturday, I'm going to keep my eye out on this Saturday, okay? Uh, there's a headline that came across today that uh, who knows what's been going on in Arizona as far as their immigration laws are concerned. Does anybody know? Last week, the Arizona legislature, and it was, a, it was signed by the governor, the state of Arizona said... We're giving the local police departments and local sheriff's offices authority to arrest illegal aliens in this country and put them in jail. Okay? 
Whereas before, the federal government said, that's our job. And has the federal government been doing their job? Now, we're not talking about people who want to come in this country the right way. I believe in that. We all did. Okay, our forefathers did. They came in a right way. Okay, but we're talking about people who refuse to go by way of the process to come into this country. And so the state of Arizona said, we're going to give the local sheriffs the authority to arrest, to ask people if they have a legitimate reason for me, ask them if they have a green card, ask them if they have a visa. We're giving them that authority. How many of you agree that's a good idea? Say amen. amen. You'd be surprised at who doesn't think that's a good idea. Okay, they're going to say, oh, they're going to profile based upon race. Well, let me tell you, I've never seen very many Germans try to get in our country from Mexico. Okay? Germans look different than Mexicans. Okay? So there has to be a certain amount. That's common sense. Okay? So anyway, that law was enacted and passed in the state of Arizona, and so now... The local sheriffs, local deputies, local law enforcement agencies can ask people, do you have a green card, do you have a visa? They can, just like a cop pulling you over, has a right to ask you for your what? Driver's license. Driving in this country is not a right, it's a privilege. Because if you don't do it right, you'll lose your license. Amen? Okay? And so being in this country is a privilege, not a right for the entire world. And so they have a right to ask them, do you have the documentation necessary to show that you are in this country legally? Makes sense, okay? The Obama administration is staunch against this thing. And the people are coming out, the New York Times, the liberals are saying, this is racism, this is profiling, this is taking our country back to all this stuff and all these terrible things. What's going to happen Saturday, 70 cities across the United States, probably St. Louis is one of them, Hispanics are going to flood the streets in protest in 70 cities across the country on May 1st. Their goal is to create chaos, confusion. And all this is going to be done on the 121st day of the year, 11 times 11, May 1st. Okay? Spirits are at work. I believe that. Spirits are at work because... Those of us who are citizens say, if you want in our country, we welcome you in our country, but you become citizens like us, which means sprechen's the same English, okay? Pay the taxes, get jobs the right way, okay? That's what we're saying. They call you racist because of that. And I can tell you, Matthew chapter 24, nation against nation. That's ethnos, that's the ethnics coming to a clash in this country. I don't know if it's going to happen Saturday, but Saturday is going to be an interesting day to watch, okay? So the Bible says let's walk circumspectly, let's, let's look at what's going on inside of our country because it has a direct effect on you and your children. You believe that? Say amen, okay? Your children are going to end up paying taxes on the amount of money, and boy, there's so much of this. Um, they're trying to force Puerto Rico into becoming a state. Okay? Puerto Rico is a, a poor territory. Okay? Forcing Puerto Rico to become a state would automatically make those Puerto Rican citizens, that, which means they would automatically be eligible for massive amounts of government handouts who's paying for it you are okay so this is this is where we're headed anyway genesis chapter 11 are you there say amen, amen. the whole earth was of one language i want you to pay close attention to what the bible's telling you concerning languages all right uh can you think of something that has to do with confusion of languages okay the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, which is Sumeria, and they dwelt there. They said one to another, go to, let us make brick, burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of 
of the whole earth. Now, we talked about this last Wednesday night. This is the exact opposite of, of God's plan and God's way. Um, I want you to leave your Bibles there, Genesis 11, because we're going to come back in a minute. I want you to take your Bible, turn to Psalm chapter 127. Psalm chapter 127, charge. You are not. Psalm 127. Read verse 1 to yourself. You can read it out loud if you want to. It doesn't matter to me. Read verse 1. Except the Lord do what? Build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Now, how many of you know what vanity is? Say amen. Vanity is when you work all day on something and you get close to the end of it and it just... its You, you work all day on a roof. You get close to the end of it. The wind blows and blows about half of your stuff all over the roof. Ever had it happen before? That's vanity, isn't it? And it's going to happen again. Because God has made us subject to vanity as long as we live in this earth. Okay? Name something that has been built that will not be destroyed in this earth. It will all be destroyed. And so, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Now, the Tower of Babel is a... um, Oh, how can I put this? This is a prime example of what happens when man tries to do what God not only is willing to do and able to do, but only what God is qualified to do. This is what happens when man tries to bring his own way to salvation. Remember, we go back to Genesis chapter 3. That's what the devil promised Eve. You can, hit, you can become God if you'll just perform this action. If you'll just do this, you will become a God. The doctrine of transubstantiation says if you eat the cookie and you drink the the alcoholic wine that they're serving up in a Roman Catholic church every Sunday, if you drink that, then you are drinking the God and eating the God and you now have the divine nature now that you have performed this action. And God's plan of salvation is the exact opposite of that. God's plan of salvation requires no action, no ritual on your part. God just simply says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe the Bible tonight? Say amen. And so anyway, man has spent 6,000 years on this earth trying to do his own thing, trying to make build his own road to heaven, trying to achieve his own godhood. We're now in a in a in an age right now technologically where man, I'm not kidding you. I'm reading this stuff nearly people are sending me stuff said Pastor Mike, you got to look at this because I promise you the next 10 years if Jesus holds himself back or if God holds him back, the next 10 years will blow your mind as far as the technology is concerned. We cannot fathom what is down the road two years from now. A lot of you were talking about your Facebook. Who knew anything about Facebook three years ago? Nobody did. And now everybody is socially networking I mean, think about, think about the ministry that we have here, prophetic research ministry. Was any of this possible 10 years ago? The technology wasn't there. The framework was being built. The technology wasn't there. We're reaching people literally all over the world. I say we. I mean, we just put this thing up and boy, it just takes off. The technology is there. Um, boy, I won't get into all that. But anyway, I promise you, we are on the verge technologically, scientifically, genetically on the verge of turning ourselves into superhumans. Believe it or not. Who remembers the $6 million man? Okay? I don't know how a guy that was supposed to run so fast ended up being so slow. Okay? Okay? $6 million is nothing anymore, right? Six million dollars. This guy down in Marshall, Missouri could have paid for that easily. The guy that won that lottery. The guy with no teeth. Well, you remember that last week? There's a guy down there with no teeth. He just barely had, he'd been working at a gas station for three weeks, had $30 in his bank account and owed money everywhere. And he bought five dollars worth of lottery tickets and won 240 some odd million dollars. Just like that. 
And you know what? We're not to be jealous of somebody like that. Because I got, listen, I know what my savings account is. Amen? Okay? I know what's laid up in store for me. Treasures beyond imagination. But anyway, we're on the verge right now of mankind becoming his own God. Superhuman ability. I mean, you name it. We can do technologically, scientifically, genetically what really only God should have a right to do. Are you with me? You're listening to me? Okay. Started out years ago, test tube babies. How many of you remember that one? That was back in the 70s. Test tube babies. Okay. Now it's grown beyond that. Now we're taking embryos and we're doing strange things with them to modify them, to genetically enhance them, to add technology to them so that humans can become gods. And I'm telling you, that which was is that which shall be. As God came down, we're going to study the language of the scriptures. As God came down in Genesis 11 and said, I'm putting a stop to this. So God will come down again. Okay? He will come down again and he will absolutely put a stop to this. All right? So anyway, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Mankind's attempt to become God is in vain because God is the one who should be... And the house is this temple right here. God should be the one building it. We talked last Wednesday night about the house that God has. The tabernacle between God and... And now the tabernacle of God is with men. That is the new city, or excuse me, the new Jerusalem, which is the heavenly city, which Jesus himself has built. He pitches his own tent. God does his own work. Can I get an amen out of you? God does his own work. So if there's something that we want done in our lives... In fact, let me just ask you this question. How many of you might, might ever consider some sort of cosmetic surgery? Just might, okay? A little flabbiness in the cheeks, get rid of some of the wrinkles around your eyes, stretch them out, okay? If you've ever considered doing your own, having cosmetic surgery, who would consider doing their own? Why not? You let the expert handle it. Amen? Okay? And hope you didn't end up on some episode of 2020 or something like that from botched plastic surgery. Anyway, the things that we want done in our lives, the things that we want done in our marriage, things we want done in our church, things we want done with ourselves, who's better qualified to handle that, us or God? And I'm telling you the things, I can tell you 43 years of experience, the things that I've tried to handle on my own and tackle on my own, I have failed miserably 100% of the time. I have a 100% failure rate in everything that I've attempted to do in life. And years ago, I had a high confidence in myself. I had a high ego in myself. I felt like I could do things. I felt like I could do more. I felt like, no wonder God called me. That's what I felt like in my youth. And God has shown me In these years that accept the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Are you with me tonight? Say amen. Amen. Okay? Including religious ideologies, religious ideas. Aren't we to be laborers in the field? Absolutely. Okay? When we labor, if if God is in the labor, then he builds the house. When we're laboring in the field, when we labor in the field... We may be planting, we may be watering, but who is it that's going to bring the increase of that field? It is going to be God and God alone. No matter what efforts we put into it, you and I, even physically, we don't have the capability of making a seed do anything. Can't do it. I looked at the garden, Sterling. Okay, You planted beans out there. Some of them come up. Some of them haven't. Okay? I don't look at you and say, you don't know what you're doing, okay? Because I know I don't. I know God is the one who is responsible for what plant comes up and what doesn't. You agree with that, say amen, okay? Religious institutions, religious ideas that are based upon the efforts and the works of man, I'm telling you, they are fruitless and they are vain. And if God hasn't built it, you're wasting your time. 
How many ministries have started out with big ideas and they say, well, God has told us to do this. And then they get on television and they want you to pay for it. We need four, we need four million dollars. So old Robert said, God told me I, we need ten million dollars, guys, or he's going to kill me. And I was hoping. I don't know if you remember that. What was that back in the early 90s? Shut himself up in the tower there on the campus there at ORU. He said, God's going to kill me if we don't get $10 million. Nonsense. Okay? Anyway, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And so here we have the epitome of mankind trying to build his own house and it won't work. You need something done? Go to the master builder. Can I hear God's people say amen tonight? All right, back at the ranch. Genesis chapter 11. Oh, look at this. Verse 5, the Lord came down. Boy, I tell you what, that number 5 just pops up. Anytime you see the Lord descending from heaven, there's a number 5 there. Okay? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. That's number 4. Then number 5, we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be of the Lord. So here we are, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Mark the, the mark my words, but mark the words of God here tonight. I promise you, God is going to make his presence known in your life and you're going to know that God is watching you. He's watching your life. He's watching what it is you're building. He's watching what it is you're doing. God, and every now and then, see this, now this, this might be a stupid question, but why does it say that God came down to see? I think, I, I think this is simple. Couldn't God see it from up in heaven? Can God see you right now, Brady? Sure he can, okay? Why did he come down? I believe that it was to make his presence known. You can look back at your life and see some of the little tower of Babels that you've been trying to build. And every now and then, God was just making himself known to you, saying, I'm watching this. And I'm going to put a stop to it. By the way, that's probably at the point with which you got saved. You think about your salvation, okay? You were building your own tower, building your own bridge to heaven, building your own way. God came down, made his presence known to you, made himself known to you, and said, I am putting a stop to this right now. And you got saved. So anyway, the Lord said, verse 6, Behold, the people is one. That's the theme of unity and in um, and, and God's presence. Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now, watch this now, here it is. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have what? Imagined to do. Sterling and I talk about this a lot. I am and, and used to be, still am, I got to fight it off most of the time. Uh, not so much as I get older in my younger years, I was a big science fiction fan. You give me comic books, science fiction books, you give me things like that, fantasy books, you give me things like that, man, I was all over it. Had a, had a big imagination. Anything had to do with space and rockets and UFOs and big feet. Okay. I was all over that. Okay. And, um, so anyway, but science fiction Science fiction has, has fed the technological world that we live in right now. Let me give you an example, okay? Ray Bradbury wrote a, wrote a uh, book called Fahrenheit 451. It was about a day in which books were banned and burned, okay? 451 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which paper will catch fire, okay? That's why he called it that. And Ray Bradbury was predicting a future. And this is, now watch this. This is some of the ways that he predicted. He wrote this back in the, in the 1950s, I believe, or early 60s, okay? He predicted that people would be sitting in their living rooms staring at an entire wall, which was a television screen. How close are we? How big are these? And how flat are these flat panel TVs? And can they make them as big as an entire wall? Absolutely. They do in these big uh, stadiums. Okay. 
And the goal, the goal of people was to have, be able to sit in their living room and have all four of their walls television screens so that they would literally be right in the midst of what was being acted out in the, in the TV show. Okay? He also said, and he called them shells, but he also said that, you know, these people would put little shells in their ears and they would constantly be feeding on music and uh, radio programming constantly. Constantly. People walking around with these little shells in their ears. Okay? That's what he said was going to be. At one point, one of the characters takes flight. Uh, and is is fleeing the the government. And all of these robots are flying through the air with cameras on him, monitoring his every step. I just read an article today. I can't remember. It was down one of the southern states that borders Mexico, federal government. Janet Napolitano, the head of, uh, of FEMA, is talking about the federal government using drone spy planes to fly up and down the border between us and Mexico so that they could patrol the borders from these little drone spy planes. That's reality. That was, in, that was watch this, that was imagined 40, 50 years ago. Maybe beyond that. Okay? Um, Jules Verne, a French novelist in the 1800s, theorized on how we would be able to get to the moon And he theorized that we would have rockets that would go in stages. And that is exactly what NASA built to get us to the moon. The imagination of man, number one, God said, is a very wicked thing. How many of you can imagine some pretty bad things? Say amen. Okay. What is it? Why is it then that Paul told us, the apostle Paul told us, Why did he tell us, Brady, to cast down imaginations? Because human beings have this thing built into us that we want to turn imagination into reality. How many of y'all know that? We want to turn imagination into reality. Look at what he says here. Um, this they now begin to do, verse 6, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And I could go into a big old long spiel tonight about how imaginary Christianity is moving in. The Sunday school literature coming out of these big publishing houses is telling kids to imagine Bible stories, to imagine God this, imagine this, imagine this. Everything has to do, when they talk about this, this curricula will inspire your child's creativity Have you ever seen that before? We're going to inspire your child's creativity. What they're saying is, we're going to to thrust your child into developing his imagination so that his imagination will eventually become his reality. That is the whole goal of witchcraft. That is what Joel Osteen teaches down in his church. The whole word faith is that if you can imagine it, then you can create your own reality. You've heard him say that, right? Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, he's nuts. I appreciate that, Gloria. God bless you. Amen. Huh? Okay. He's crazy. He says that if you imagine it, then you can create it. That's what, that is the Tower of Babel right here. And God said, there's going to come a time. Listen, I want to tell you something. Be careful. Listen to me now. Be careful about what you imagine. And your imaginations are fed by what you see. Did you listen to that? Be careful about what you imagine because your imaginations are fed by what you see. Okay? I, as a, as a young man, as a child, I used to read a lot of comic books, used to watch a lot of science fiction. In fact, if it was science fiction, I wanted it. I wanted to be the Incredible Hulk. I tried to make myself mad enough to turn green and big, okay? I was hoping that gamma radiation would just change, alter my DNA, okay? Huh? I'm halfway there. Yeah, you don't want to know what I'm imagining right now, old timer, okay? Let me tell you this, okay? 
The comic books that I read, the TV shows, the movies that I watched, they fed my imagination. And I'm 43 years old, fixing to be 44, and I'm telling you, my imagination can still be pretty active. We imagine, our imagination is fed by what we see. And so, you take TV shows like Heroes. Anybody ever watch Heroes? Heroes is about these people who have their DNA altered, and one guy, one guy has the ability to disappear, make himself invisible. Another person has the ability to read your thoughts and actually project images into your mind to make you think that that's reality. One person has the ability to move objects just with their hand and kill from a distance, okay? One person has the ability to hear things from hundreds of miles. I mean, all of these things, all of these people called heroes in this TV show, and you're watching this, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I finally quit watching it, but I'm watching it to analyze what's going on because I see what's going on, but I catch myself going, boy, that, that would be cool to do right there, right? I mean, that, that would be cool, like, you know, to just go like, like that and throw electricity at somebody and fry them. Because I wanted to do that to a guy that was pulled out in front of me on the highway. <laughs> one guy has the ability to transport himself from one place to the other instantly. Like Philip did in the book of Acts. Okay. And it feeds people. We People see this. Young people especially. Kids. Boys. They watch this. And they say, man, I want that. 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 And it feeds the imagination. And mankind always brings himself to where his imaginations become reality. This is why God said not to worship graven what? Images. The imagination should be left out of the equation of what we're going to worship and how we're going to worship God. Can I hear somebody say amen? Okay? And God's looking at the imaginations of man. And he said, I'm going to put a stop to it. So he says in verse 7, go to, let us go down and there confound their language. That they may not understand one another's speech. That's what God said. So the Lord scattered them abroad, verse 8, from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build the city. In other words, they were building one day and God spoke the word. And he can, conf- oh, mm, I just got something. I told you I count. Okay. Believe it or not, I have a note here in my Bible. Now, this is an old note. I have not verified it. But in verse six and seven are the words of God. This is the words that God spoke. According to my count here, I have 50 words. And with that 50 words, God confused languages. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Does anybody know what Pentecost means? 50 days. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Guys, what happened? Bingo. Bingo. This boy, I like this King James Bible, amen? amen. See how, just, see how God, God just puts things together for us, doesn't he? Because he always, always works in order. He always goes in order. He's showing you what's going to happen and what's going to befall mankind in the last days. Uh, In fact, let's let's go to that now because God used confusion of languages. I want you to take your Bible real quickly now. Turn to uh, Psalm 35. I just got a couple verses here in Psalms and we're going to move on. Psalm 35 because I'm fixing to say something that, you know, it's being recorded. It's going to be out on the Internet. It's going to be sent to people's homes. And I guarantee you somebody's not going to like it. But you might as well say it anyway. If it's a truth, you might as well say it. Say it in love, and I do. I love people. I love God's people. I love people who want to know the truth. And I can tell you that there are some people that are so entrenched in falsehood that the truth is just not recognizable to them. Psalm 35, look at verse 3. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me, saying to my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be what? confounded, verse 4, and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Confusion, watch this now, confusion is not knowing. Confusion is not knowing. September 11, 2001. Think of the number 11. Was there confusion on that day? Did you know that those towers 
were 110 stories tall. That's 11 times 10. 11th day in the 11th state. And these towers look like a big gigantic what? That was a day of confusion and disorder. Okay? And on that day, people did not know. And, and confusion is always a symbol from God of his judgment because people don't want to know the truth. What was that verse you were going to tell me about? Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Guess what verse? If you said, if you'd have said 14, I'd have smacked you. Yeah, go ahead. And you know there's somebody listening to this going, Brother Pastor Mike's getting violent. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 10. Because verse 10 is going to lead you to verse 11. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. How many of you know somebody that just doesn't want to be saved? And you love them and you pray for them. They just don't want to be saved. They don't love the truth. They'd rather live in their lies. And so look at verse 11. For this cause, God shall send them strong what? delusion that they should believe a lie you know what that lie is so that he is god sitteth in the temple of god showing himself that he is god that's the lie okay was israel confused on the day of christ's crucifixion listen to me now was israel confused on the day of christ's crucifixion they had their Messiah standing here and they had a murderer that they pulled out of prison named Barabbas. And Pontius Pilate, wanting to be freed from this, said, and he went and picked the worst thing that he can imagine. A zealot named Barabbas who was a murderer. He was, a, he was, an, he was trying to overthrow the Roman government and get them out of the land of Israel. And he was a murderer. He had killed his own people. That, that's kind of what some think. So they brought, Pilate went and got the worst thing that he could find in prison and stood him up there. Old stinky, nasty, ugly, greasy-headed Barabbas standing there. Flies flying on him, and you can just imagine. And here's the Savior of the world. And he said, choose. And they said, give us Barabbas. That's confusion. So watch this now. Here's Christ up on the cross. And he says these words. Eloi, Eloi. Lama Sabachthani. And they stood around him and they did not know what he was saying. They said, what is he saying? He's calling for Elijah. No, he wasn't. He was quoting Psalm 22. Because in your King James, I like it because that's the interpretation of languages. Which is interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when you go look in Psalm 22, you'll see. They pierce my hands and feet. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. The prophecies were fulfilled on the cross. And those Jews who knew the Bible, especially those priests standing there, should have known that their Messiah was hanging on a tree exactly the way it was prophesied. But what happened? God had sent them over a strong delusion. And they were believing something that wasn't true. I don't know about you. I've been lied to. I've been lied about. I've been lied to. I've even told some lies myself. And I'll tell you, I'd rather have the truth any day. I'd rather have the truth any day. You tell me you think I'm ugly. I'd rather, you th I'd rather know that I was ugly than to go around throwing myself off like I was some pretty guy. Okay? I want to know the truth. Okay? Um, anyway, 2 Thessalonians 2, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Confusion is always a sign Always a sign of God's judgment. Um, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. 
Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11 there, bud. 1 Corinthians 14. I dare you to turn there. Okay? Paul said, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. You know who he's talking about? Those that speak in unknown tongues. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. What were the tongues, what were the unknown tongues that are the gift of the Spirit? What are they? According to Scripture, not according to what you see in a church, but according to the Scripture, what are the unknown tongues? The known languages spoken in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. There were people there that knew them. That stands in stark contrast to the so-called gift of tongues where I've had people admit to me I believe that I can speak in a language a prayer language that when it comes out of me I do not know what I am saying that is not the spirit of God we are we are the the new man is formed in knowledge knowing okay not confusion I do not, have not, and will not believe that this Babylonian gibberish that comes out of people's mouth is from the Holy Ghost. And you'll never show me that from the King James Bible. But I did it, and it felt right. I, listen, feelings are nothing compared to the Word. Yeah. Amen? And I'm just... And you, I, I, well, I won't, I won't be mean about it, but I'm just telling you, confusion of languages is, is God's judgment upon people who do not want to know the truth, okay? And so the idea is, is that the confusion of languages moves in when the King James starts moving out, okay? So how many Bibles do we have in most churches now? They put them up because there's so many of them now people don't even bring a Bible. They throw them up on the screen. Well, let me show you what the Message Bible says. Now, I like the way the NIV says this. Now, in today's English version, it says this. In the Holman Standard, it says this. And only, only when the King James Bible verse agrees with their sermon will they use the King James Bible verse. That's how they do it. And I'm telling you, God's method of confusion. Anyway, the, the Tower of Babel is going to be rebuilt. I have a deal here a slide i was going to show you tonight but i'm not going to the european parliament building in uh, brussels belgium i believe it is 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 modeled exactly like the unfinished tower of babel okay i'm telling you that spirit is still at work to restore babel in these last days to bring about a new world order to bring it to bring everybody back together as one in spite of the language barriers okay that which was is that which shall be, and there's no new thing in the sun, but I want to say this, and we're going to leave. If you're building it and God's not in it, you're wasting your time. You can't fix your marriage, but God can, okay? You can't, you can't repair your house as far as the home, the family, but God can, okay? You can't fix broken relationships, but God can. You can't, I'm telling you, there's not any area of life that this does not apply to. Christianity is not about human effort. It is the exact opposite of it. It is about God's effort. Let me hear God's people say amen. amen. It's about God's effort and not ours. But our desire has to be there. Let's stand to our feet.